I think we're recording. All right. All right. Welcome to Uncolored. I'm, I'm back again for another show. Um, I guess. I, I don't really don't. Forget it. So I'm finally going to finish up the J. Warner Wallace book, like I've been uh, threatening for the last, I don't know how long. Um, but I'm going to make it quick. I'm going to make a quick show. But at the end of the the J. Warner Wallace thing, when I finish up this part of the uh, this episode, I don't know what to call these things. Um, I, I got a treat. I'm going to do a, a special uh, uncolored sports segment. And this time it's going to be on Deshaun Watson. Now, I'm not going to bag on him. I'm not going to get into any of his legal stuff. Well, I'm going to get into some of it. But I don't know what his legal stuff is. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what's going on. I'm not in any of that. And I'm not going to hammer on him. What I am going to do is I'm going to give you a perspective that I haven't heard out there. And and everybody's talking about if he's available, you got to take him. He's he's the top five quarterback. Um, everybody that I've heard says if he's available, you need to take him immediately. I'm not so sure. So we're going to get to that in the Uncolored Sports segment. But first, let me finish up with uh, this book, uh, J. Warner Wallace, Person of Interest. That's the one we've been going through. Talking about J. Warner Wallace is a uh, former detective uh, for for the uh, he's a forensic detective for I don't know some PD down south in L.A. and uh, was an atheist became a Christian and the guy's got this crazy brain and so he been began applying some of his forensic techniques to the study of this question of is 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 Jesus real the the cross all these things that that people talk about all the time and and it turned out that he. Um, came to the conclusion that it's all real. Uh, so this is, I don't know if this is his first book. I got to imagine he's written something else, but he's got a website. Um, I don't know what it is and I should. Well, let me find out what it is right now. Look at this. I'm, I'm doing a new thing where I can just go to the internet and find stuff out. Let me see. Uh, J. Warner. There we go. J. Warner Wallace. He's got a website called... Cold Case Christianity. That's his website. It's got a number of resources on there about a whole bunch of different stuff. But this particular book, Person of Interest, is what I've been going through the last uh, couple of weeks. So I've been focused on this um, this issue between, um, is there a problem between God and science? That nonsense. And so that's why I've been focused specifically at this part of the book. I haven't read the whole thing yet. So I just want to follow up uh, with this last segment. And what it talks about is the rich history of uh, Jesus's followers. And so he goes on to talk about the contributions that people who believed in God were Christians, or I guess in some way or another, um, believed that God is real, and their contributions to the, uh, the scientific endeavor. The point being is that if there was some conflict, you wouldn't have uh, so many people. So he goes on to talk about he's got this hall of fame and he has this picture of the iceberg there saying that the idea is that the people that he's going to mention are just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many more uh, scientists who believe in God that you've never heard of or at least didn't reach the height of fame that that these people that we're going to talk about have reached. But there certainly were more and more that we haven't heard about or talked about um, that, you know, are not in this book. So he first starts off with the antiquity, the people who started out in the beginning. And he says, John, uh, one of the people who are famous in this modern hall of fame uh, was John Philoponus, the Byzantine Christian philosopher who theorized about the nature of light and stars and is known as the father of the modern Kalam cosmological argument. The co Kalam cosmological argument sometimes... Um, uh, represented by KCA. I think it's popularized most by a guy named William Lane Craig, one of my uh, philosophical heroes, I guess you could say. And a lot of people. The guy's a brilliant, brilliant super guy. Super brilliant guy. <laughs> um, but that's basically the cos Kalam Cosmical Art. Kalam Kal the KCA was something like this. That everything that begins to exist has a reason for its um, existence. And since the universe began to exist, then it has some reason for its existence. There's another way you can do it that's, uh, that, that uses cause instead of reason. Um, the, the, the one I said, it deals with the principle of sufficient reason. And that's usually the sticking point there. 
But the other way you can run it is say that anything that begins to exist has a cause. Uh, the universe began to exist, so the universe has some kind of a cause. And in that one, typically, it's the term cause that people will quibble with when they, they want to challenge that argument. At least that's what I've heard. Um, either way, what people like uh, William Lane Craig go on to reason is that because of the nature of the evidence from science and philosophy, you'd have to conclude that the best um, answer to that or the best cause or reason, if you run it the other, the first way that I said it, it have to be God or something that we, uh, that we would call God. So apparently this guy, uh, John Philoponus, was the father of that particular argument. Uh, going on in the book, there's these other fathers that he, um, that uh, J. Warner Wallace makes reference to. Uh, but what he says is, and here's another interesting that I, that I found interesting. I, I'm just kind of skipping over it because I don't want to get too deep into it. I've spent a lot of time on it anyway, but I just want to go over some of the highlights that caught my attention as I was going through the book. Uh, most of the oldest hospitals operating in the world were formed by Christians, and institutions formed by Jesus' followers are still recognized as the largest non-government provider of health care services in the world. That's pretty fantastic. Um, now we go to the Middle Ages, getting closer to our time. It says new scientific uh, disciplines emerged and older disciplines advanced. In addition to the science Scientific fields already describes Christians com contributors. I'm sorry, Christians contributed to pathological anatomy, anthropology, geometry, geology. I, I don't read so well. Um, botany, ichnology. I don't know what that is. Paleontology, cartography, meteorology, zoology, and mineralogy. Mineralogy. Many of these contributors are still considered fathers in their particular fields. List those people. Wallace says here, the collective work of Christian scientists, and, and, and they're not Christian scientists. That's a whole different group, I think. He's talking about Christians who were scientists, not Christian scientists, and I think that's a whole different thing. Um, through the early Middle Ages, Middle Ages and early Renaissance was dwarfed by the degree to which Jesus' followers contributed to the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th centuries. Christians dominated this period of scientific advancement in which every modern discipline emerged. With well over 200 busts honoring this, uh, the scientists of this period, this rotunda wouldn't even have room for visitors. When he talks about the busts um, and the rotunda, he's simply talking about that as a figure of speech um, because he's talking about these people as if there was like a hall of fame, like the, the football hall of fame. Um, and, you know, they've got the busts in there. And so that's, he's using that kind of imagery to talk about this, uh, these people in the scientific field. Uh, he says, the disproportionate con contribution of Jesus' followers during the scientific revolution is undeniable. Oof. But if he would have likely described this for me when I was an atheist talking about himself, I would have probably been unimpressed. And he says he would have responded something like, well, of course, uh, we were uh, Christians were involved in the sciences back then because every, almost everybody in Europe was a Christian in those days. And then uh, parenthetically, he says, I hadn't seen the evidence that Christianity was just was the catalyst for the explosion of science rather than a coincidence. But he goes on to continue his thought if he was an atheist. But once uh, humans discover the power of science to explain the universe, I'll bet Christians didn't influence science anymore. This is along the lines of what... Um, the enlightened folks would tell you. The enlightened folks paint a picture, if you talk to them, that, yeah, they'll say, okay, yeah, Christians started it, but we took it over, and really that's when all the advances began. We're the ones who sort of wrested science from the hand of these medieval, dark-aged philosophers who were kind of walking around in, you know, caves huddled up with, with fire and stuff like that, and the enlightenment is the period where science blossomed. Not the case. He says, Jesus's followers also dominated the late modern, even post-Darwin era, because some of the idea would, he would have said, you know, when Darwin came out with his theory, the, the involvement of Christians in science would have started to dwindle. That's the opposite uh, is true. He says, this rotunda in our Hall of Fame would have been the largest yet, holding nearly 450 heroes just from the tip, meaning these are the ones that you know about who were famous for the time, 
there's a lot of who a lot of people who believed in God and were great in science who may not have gotten the recognition that these 450 people did. Um, he says, as Darwin's work developed and was eventually published, Jesus's followers contributed to the conversation. Some agreed with Darwin's conclusions to one degree or another, and some did not. Many saw no incompatibility between evolution and the claims of Christianity, and notable Christians engaged or contributed to their proposal. Several even became known as the fathers of evolutionary disciplines. So this this statement that, well, I'm not even going to get into that. That's, that's just nonsense. I was going to go into the Dawkins statement about how Darwin allowed him to become a, a uh, intellectually fulfilled atheist. Because for a lot of, this is my theory. I think for a lot of atheists, Darwin's theory wasn't so much a great scientific theory. Because over the years, as it's been examined um, and new things have been found out, there were a lot of things that, you know, it's not his fault. He didn't know what a cell was. He thought it was just this blob of protoplasm. So it wasn't Darwin's fault. Still a brilliant guy. But as more and more science has discovered things, things, <laughs> more, more more scientific discoveries, I think that's probably what they would call them. Um, Darwin, the Darwinian theory of evolution is all but defunct. And I don't know that there's any credible scientists who still hold to uh, Darwinian evolution. They've now moved on to uh, what they would call the new synthesis, which integrates, um, you know, genes and cells and all of that stuff. And then I think there's a third version of it coming down the pike because um, the this the the gene mutation uh, new synthesis idea has some ins and in, ins insurmountable insuperable problems. That's the William Lane Craig. I had to give myself a point for insuperable in the right context. Um, so even the new synthesis has some big, big insuperable problems. Um, I'm not going to give myself another point. I, I was just, I just gave myself a point for that. Um, so they've moved on to something else. The point being that while Darwin's theory was great at the time, it had no effect on Christians' involvement in science, and, and in fact, it still grew. And in fact, many Christians contributed to the evolutionary sciences. Um, so, you know, no soap there. Now he talks about this latest group, this contemporary group of uh, scientists in the, in the modern era. And these people are still alive to a large degree, the current generation uh, of science. And again, we're still talking about just the tip of the iceberg of scientific contributors. This latest group is on pace. This is what J. Warren Wallace is writing. This latest group is on pace to be the most awarded group of Christian thinkers by percentage in any era. They are the founders of the New Disciplines and International Award winners. So in the final um, part of this uh, chapter, he goes on to list uh, some of the disciplines. And I don't know if this is an exhaustive list. You can go on his website and he has a much more exhaustive list. Um, he also lists all of the modern universities, modern universities, all of the universities that were founded by Christians uh, around the world. And the list is, I mean, all of the major universities, pretty much, um, were founded by Christians. So again, the idea that somehow you have to put your mind aside if you want to be a Christian, it's, it's, it's craziness. It's nonsense. It's desperation, I think, by a lot of atheists who can see that there is no conflict, but that doesn't go with their ideology, that God isn't real or God's somehow a problem, because there's just too much evidence to the contrary. It's just a crazy, and I think crazy, and I think it's a desperate idea. If you just look at just the evidence, you it, it's... It's difficult to see how you could come to the conclusion that there's some kind of conflict between God and science. Not with all this going on. And it's all historically verified. You can't get around it. Anyway, some of the scientific disciplines. Now, Warner Wallace says, hey, please don't, you, should, you shouldn't skip it. You should read every one. We're going to skip some because there's a whole lot here and we don't, we don't, don't want to spend all the time. You should get the book and read it for yourself is what I'm saying. But... 
co-fathers of modern science, father of experimental sciences, uh, father of atomic energy and nuclear physicist, father of uh, modern theoretical astrophysics, the father of modern biology, fathers of cell biology, embryology, cytology, bacteriology, the genome product. That's a guy, the project, that's a guy, I can't remember his name, um, but he was the guy who, well, he wasn't the guy, I'm sure there's a lot of people involved, but this genome project, well, we'll get into it. it this is the thing where people, before the genome product, there was like, percent of genes nobody knew what they did and they used to call them junk dna because they, they had an effect they did the genome product and found that they got the project and they find out there's all kinds of uses all kinds of, of functions that this dna have it's amazing some of the things they can do and now they have this thing called blast and i don't know what the acronym stands for but you can i don't know you can get like a gene or dna and you can put it in the computer and it can tell you i don't know where it came from or if it has any you know, if it's related, it's amazing stuff, what these, what these folks can do. But again, Christians oftentimes are at the forefront of all of these things, uh, these discoveries and, and these scientific, um, you know, endeavors. Uh, quantum mechanics, wow. Uh, meteorology, modern meteorology, tropical meteorology, modern zoology, ethology, uh, entomology of living insects, uh, modern crystallography, mineralogy, optometry, Anthropology and mathematics, logarithms, tensor calculus, trigonometry, Euclidic, non loop, you, I'm going to skip that one. Uh, descriptive geometry, Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci sequence, if it's what I'm thinking of, is fantastic. It's, it's, it's a super cool thing. And I think it's got something with shapes and circles. I don't remember. But, but if you YouTube it, it it's fantastic stuff. Um, modern epistemology, this is the philosophies. Uh, modern statistical and experimental design, uh, the Kalam cosm cosmological argument, T transcendental Thomism, whatever the heck that is, I have no idea. Regional sciences, these are the, the, the father of scientists in different regions around the world, and it goes on and on. Evolutionary theory, this is what we were talking about earlier, where um, even Christians were at the forefront of evolutionary theory. Uh, the father of evolutionism, don't know what that is. Uh, evolutionary genetics, conscious evolution, evolutionary ecology, evolutionary economics, uh, medical, gynecology, nutrition, x-ray, the MRI, um, energy, electromagnetics, uh, quantum electromagnetics, uh, electrodynamics, uh, the black hole concept. Listen, we can go on forever, but... Um, Dying and flying, computer sciences, engineering and technology, and other cool stuff, hydrogen peroxide. People who believe in God, people who are Christians, people who do science with the idea that learning about the real world, the natural world, will tell them about God, that there's no end to the number of contributors in these areas. And I just want to sum up with this, and I know I've said it before. Anybody who tells you that there's some conflict between uh, God and science is a liar or simply ignorant because the data is all here for anybody who wants to see. And this is just one book. There's dozens of books that talk about these things. I, I, I'm not going to, I don't know if I can do it. I might screw up the camera because I'm just learning this new thing that I'm doing here, uh, this screen sharing stuff. So I don't want to screw it up, but there's, there's no end to the books that document these very things. So, so even atheists who don't believe in God, and that's fine, um, know this stuff. And so those atheists who want to con 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 concoct an asinine narrative that somehow there's a conflict or that when you go into your biology or, or science class or whatever class, you, and, and you've got some instructor who's such an ass such an idiot who's going to tell you that your belief in God is, is in conflict with science is an idiot. He's an a-hole. Now, you don't have to tell him that, but you just know that because all of the data is here. So I'm going to end with that. Um, that, that, that is enough of that. Uh, I'm going to take a quick break and set up for the Deshaun Watson uncolored sports segment. Uh, so just be out here for just a little bit, and then I'll, I'll, I'll work on that. Oh, yes, that's what I'll be doing. All right. Uh, 
So welcome back. This is Kevin Metcalf. This is going to be the uncolored sports segment. I don't do it very often, but I hope to do more of it because there's a lot of a lot of interesting topics that I like to get in here that I think um, are fascinating. Now, as I said, I'm not going to hammer on Deshaun Watson. I don't have anything against them. I, I don't have anything against any of these folks. Um, listen, I'm like any sports guy. There are people I like and people that I don't like. But just on a human level, I, I don't know anything about Deshaun Watson, and I hope everything works out for him and, you know, or not. I don't know. But I'm just saying... I'm not here to hammer on the guy. Um, This is going to be a primarily a football issue. So as I said, there's a lot of folks who, if if you listen to the sports, now I've got all these quarterback moves. Aaron Rodgers is back with uh, Green Bay. Uh, uh, Russell Wilson went to Denver. And and, uh, who was it? Uh, Indianapolis just traded Carson Wentz to uh, Washington. So there's all this quarterback movement. Who's going to go where? Who's going to do what? And everybody's going to listen. Deshaun Watson's legal... Uh, issues somehow resolve themselves, then he's got to be your number one guy. Okay, you know, maybe. Um, but I see some problems. So just recently, there was the, the NFL Combine. And one of the things that the M- NFL Combine is for, I guess probably the main thing it's for, well, it's for promoting stuff and getting drunk and doing whatever they do. Uh, but one of the things they do is, so you get all these college athletes who are now entering into the league or at least hoping to be a part of the NFL. And what they do with this combine is they test them out, but not just physically, because that's what you see on TV. They do the 40-yard dash and the leaping and the jumping and the going through the cones. Um, Another thing they do is uh, mental psychological testing. And so they'll get them in the room and they'll try to get them upset and see how they react. They look at their history and things that they've done in college to see what they've done. You know, what are they going to react in in certain situations? And uh, they do like a wonderlick test to, to, and it's some kind of a, I don't, I don't know, intelligence test. I don't know. Excuse me. I don't know what it's about. But the point of it is this. What they're trying to figure out is these NFL organizations is. They're going to make a large investment in these kids. I don't know if they're kids anymore. I mean, they're, they're adults, I guess. And they want to know if this kid is worth the investment that we're going to make in them. And it's not just money. It's resources, time, effort. They're going to, if they pick this person, they lose out on another pick that could have been better. So it's a big decision. And so they want to test and make sure that the resources that they're going to invest in this perspective, prospective uh, NFL player, this college kid who wants to play in the NFL, they want to know if it's going to be worth it. That they're not going to be, you know, six months later, a year from now going, man, what a bust. We wasted our money. Okay, now, enter Deshaun Watson. He's had a fantastic NFL career so far. Hasn't had a lot of wins, um, but he's done good. <clears throat> I shouldn't say he hasn't, hasn't had a lot of wins. He hasn't won as much as, you know, you would hope somebody who has that kind of talent would win. Um, But everybody, if you go across the board, all the NFL experts, and I'm not one, so I go with what they say. If they say he's one of the greatest, I'm not going to argue that. Um, But I see some problems. One, he accepted a huge contract from the Houston Texans, had a nice press conferences, Got all, you know, teary-eyed, you know, was very, seemed to be, he was very happy with the organization, um, loved the money, was very excited about it. Uh, A few months later, he quit. Don't know why. And I don't know if it's justified or unjust. I have no idea. But what I do know is he accepted money from the organization to play football. And at some point, he just goes, I quit. Not going to play for you. Going to keep the money, but I'm not going to play for you. Okay, that's a problem. I think that's a problem. Now, I don't know what kind of problem it is. I'm not an NFL owner, but I got to tell you, if I had hired somebody to do a job, whatever it is, and I'm, I don't even have a, I'm not even an employer, but if I was an employer and I hired somebody to do a job, and they're excited about the job, shaking everybody's hand, and then at some point in time, they go, you know, I quit, but I still want the money. That's a problem. Here's the other problem. Like everybody says, the most talented guy out there, well, not the most, but you know, he's top five, many people say. Again, I'm not going to argue. He went 4-12 and his last season that he played, 2020. 
won four games. Okay. I don't know how you do that. If you're as good as everybody's saying you are, you just got four games. And if you look at his stats, I don't have his stats up here. Maybe I can pull them up. Uh, his personal stats as a quarterback, phenomenal. What did he have? I don't know. What is it? 2020 season? He threw for what? Almost 5,000 yards. That's a lot of yards, right? 33 touchdowns, uh, touchdown percentage, 6.1, I guess. Interception, 7. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what most of these stats mean. Uh, but but his yards per attempt is uh, 8.9. That's super high. So he had a great year. Four wins. Now, it seems to me if you're paying a franchise quarterback, you got to give me six, seven wins, right? Just you. If if And you can say, well, his team's talk is bad. All right. If you're that talented and you're getting that kind of money, if your wide receiver was, I don't know, working at, Walmart yesterday, and that's your top receiver, you got to give me more than four wins, right? If, if your coach uh, also works at the barbershop three days a week, you got more, that four is not enough for, for a superstar quarterback. Russell Wilson has been playing with no offensive line for the last four or five years. This is his first losing season. And Part of it was because of an injury. If he wasn't, didn't have that injury, he probably would have had another winning season. And Russell Wilson hasn't had the most talented team around him. I don't even think him and his coach get along, which is why he's in Denver now. But he's never had a losing season until now. If you're a star quarterback and as great as everybody says you are, I don't know, man, four wins. That's a problem for me. If I'm, if I'm an NFL team going, well, are we going to pay him all that money? for four wins and he quit. I don't know. I, I don't know about that. Now let's get to the legal stuff. I don't know anything about it. Or I should, I say, I don't know anything that anybody else knows about it from whatever you hear on, on your local sports station. Here's the thing. Guilty or not guilty. And I have no idea. Um, clearly he has a problem with his conduct in certain locations, right? It's, it's very difficult to get this many people mad at you when you walk into some place of business, so much so that they want to, 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 to start legal action against you. That's not easy. That's hard to do. That's, that's not easy to do. There's something about you, and I don't know what time period we're talking about in this thing, but in, but in a fairly short time period, there's a number of people who want to take legal action against you because of your conduct in a particular place of business. That, that's a thing. I don't think that's nothing. Right? I mean, if, if I was going into, I don't know, McDonald's, every time I go into a McDonald's, somebody wants to call the police or, you know, file a lawsuit, you know, hopefully a friend of mine would go, hey, Kevin, what's going on with, with you at McDonald's? Why can't you go in and get the number two and come out without somebody want to call the cops on you? Right. Maybe you want to try the drive through or, or, or may, maybe listen, I'll go for you. Right. I'll fly you by. You, you just probably should stay out of McDonald's because because every time you walk in, somebody wants to, you know, take legal action against you. That's a problem. OK. Now, again, I don't know what any of this means. But it's something. I, I mean, Houston figured it out. Houston was the happiest team in the world when they had him signed. A few months later, they're paying a guy who's not going to do anything for him and have to still pay him. Same guy. Right? 4-12 uh, and 12 record. Got paid. Happy and in tears. And quit. And for some reason has problems in certain places of business so much so that people want to file legal charges against them. And all I'm saying is that's something that ain't nothing. And so when everybody's going, boy, you really got to hire him. I don't know. And, and look, at, I'm not saying you should never play in the NFL again. I would never say that. I, I'm I'm a uh, I, I call my I think I am. I think I am uh, a free market absolutist. If somebody has something 
and somebody else wants to give them something for it, hey, if it ain't bothering me and ain't bothering the country, I'm okay with it. So, so I'm not trying to say he should never have a job. I Listen, if he has a great career, so much the better. I'm not wishing any ill on anybody. I'm just saying, if I'm a, if I'm a team, I'd ask some questions, man. And I'm not saying that I wouldn't take them. I probably would. If I was Indiana, probably take them. Right? If you're, if you're one of these teams that needs a quarterback, I'm not saying that you wouldn't take them, especially now that, that nobody seems to want to believe all women anymore. I don't hear any of those cries. So apparently, everybody's okay with it. They're, they're having a conflict with the woman thing and the black thing. So, listen, we're just not going to do anything about it. Right? We don't, we don't want you to believe all women if the guy is black. Right? So, so, apparently, there's not going to be any outcry from women if you hire them. Because he's black. So good for him. Use it. Right? But I'll tell you what, if I hired him, the, the contract, it would be rotten with incentives. I, there would be incentives all over the place for everything. Every, every dollar would be connected to some incentive in the contract. There would be nothing guaranteed. Not from me. If I was hiring him, I, I, it'd be a whole lot of money. I say you get the highest contract of any NFL player ever, but every dollar is incentivized. There is nothing guaranteed. I would. That's that's how I would do it. You can have all the money if you play and and don't act a fool. But the minute there's a problem, you're not paying anymore. Everything would be incentivized. Every single dollar. That's what I would do. So that's my take on Deshaun Watson. Um, again. Hope, wish everybody luck. I don't know who did what. I, I wish the, the women luck. I wish him luck. I don't know what happened to him, but 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 hopefully everything works out the way it's supposed to. Uh, but as far as an NFL team, NFL team hiring him because he's a great quarterback and he's going to take your team to the Super Bowl. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That's all I'm saying. Uh, talk to the Houston Texans and and and, you know, they, they, they might have a different opinion on that if you're a team. So. All right, that's enough. That's it. That's the uh, the uncolored uh, sports segment. Um, as always, if you have any questions, comments, problems with anything I said, check the comments. I haven't been good at checking the comments. I got to be honest, but you know, there's, there's like 26 people. But I'll be more diligent about that. And uh, pretty soon, I'm going to hire somebody uh, as a producer to help me with all this internet stuff, the 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 social media junk, because I'm not good with any of that stuff. Um, and hopefully, when I get that person. Um, I'll be better about replying and, and interacting because that's apparently something I have to do here. I can't just sit here in my head and, and yammer to nobody. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Please subscribe. Um, and what else did they say? There's a notification bell. So subscribe, notify, all that stuff. And uh, I'll come back next time with another uncolored um, thing here. So thanks for listening. That's enough of me. I'm out of here.